officially open this vlog. I have some reading updates for you, but first a quick little chit chat. So today was supposed to be the start of my next grad course and I already wasn't feeling great about it. I had a sneak peek of what was going to be in the course the week before and I saw all of the reading that was going to be involved, how heavy it was going to be. And I just kind of reckoned with myself. I had an honest come to Jesus and I said, you know what? Mentally, I am not capable of doing this course right now. It is by far going to be one of the most labor intensive in terms of reading for sure. This morning, I really spent some time hemming and hawing about it because I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to take a break for a couple of reasons. The first of which is because I know that momentum is crucial to keep going. I feel like if I were to take a break, then I'm never going to get going again. But at the same time, I feel like taking a break could do wonders for my ability to want to continue. You know what I mean? I also wasn't feeling great about it because you know that feeling you get when you've accomplished something you didn't think you could do or that you've just been stressed out about for so long. When I decided not to take this class this term, I felt like a hundred pound weight lifted off my shoulders. I felt so much better about everything. So I had that sense of relief. I had that sense of accomplishment, but I didn't actually accomplish anything because I still have to take this class. It's still coming. So now I feel like I've just added something else to my to-do list. So I get to have anxiety about what is upcoming rather than just getting it out of the way, if that makes sense. I also am really hard on myself. I feel like I should just be able to push through. Like I should just get over it and do it and get the job done. But I also feel like that's not the best option. I'm having a lot of emotions this morning, but ultimately I did make the decision to move this course to next term. So I'm going to pick it right back up in June when the next term starts and I'm going to be okay with that. I just need to give myself grace. This is something that I'm doing for me. Nobody is making me get a master's. I don't need to get a master's. I've always wanted to do it. Something like I want to prove to myself and I feel like dropping the term is proving me right that I cannot do this. You know what I mean? So again, a lot of emotions, but anyway, that's not why you're here. You were here for a reading update. So I did finish the Happy Ever After playlist by Abby Jimenez yesterday and I gave it a 4.5 stars. Abby Jimenez for the most part can just do no wrong in my opinion. I absolutely love her. I think she writes some of the most solid romances out there. I would still say that my issues still stand. I wasn't really vibing with the fact that Jason was a rock star. I felt like Sloane was doing some things that were pretty out of character for her. I don't really feel like we got enough of Sloane's grieving process. I don't really feel like we were able to go through that with her. And so in some ways it kind of felt like her getting with Jason was fast. There were definitely some technical issues. And also of course the book ended with our main character pregnant. And you all know how I feel about that. You all know that I hate a pregnancy ending. Even in the epilogue, I don't like it. I especially hate fake and surprise pregnancies, but I even even hate the epilogue pregnancies as well. But you know what? The rest of the things that happened in the epilogue were super cute. There was even a really touching scene between Jason and Brandon. And if you've read it, you know what I'm talking about. And it was just beautiful. That actually almost had me tearing up a little bit. I just feel like Abby Jimenez does so many things well in romances, especially the way that she develops her characters and the harder hitting elements that she puts into her books. She is officially my favorite romance author. I have only one more book to read before I have read her to zero. And I'm very excited about the new release that is coming out in April. And then immediately after finishing the Happy Ever After playlist, I felt like I needed to switch gears a little bit. I felt like I needed something that was going to be a little bit lighter emotionally. So I picked up the last one by Will Dean. This is the book that I'm now going to read for a book related to the sea. I was originally going to read Be Still My Heart for that and I ultimately ended up not continuing with that book because I knew it wasn't going to be for me. So I picked up the last one. This is a thriller suspense by Will Dean. I have really enjoyed his last two books and so I was excited to get to this. But unfortunately this one is not really doing it for me. It follows our main character Caroline and she and her boyfriend are going on this luxury liner across the Atlantic. Atlantic from England to America. And very near the beginning of the story, Caroline wakes up and Pete is gone. But not only is Pete gone, but literally almost everybody else on board is gone. And eventually she comes in contact with a couple of other people that are still left on the ship. And we have no idea what's happening. We have no idea where everybody else went. And I've just gotten to a point in the story where we're receiving somewhat of an explanation and I'm not really digging it. And I really don't even like the characters that we're following in the story either. And I don't really care. I'm not necessarily connected or invested in the story, but we're going to see how it ends. Like, I said, I really enjoyed Will Dean in the past and I'm hoping to pull this through, but regardless, it's going to be a quick, easy read. I'll definitely finish it by tomorrow and can move on to the next book on my TBR list. But I just wanted to come on here and give you kind of a little life update, a little bit of a reading update. And now, of course, I've got to get back to work though. So I'll talk to you later.
Hi friends, it is currently Wednesday morning, March 13th, and I'm just about to head into work, but I finished the last one by Will Dean, and I wanted to come on here and update you because I have thoughts. I honestly was not impressed by this story, which is really disappointing because of my past experience with Will Dean. This book felt like it was written by an entirely different person. So again, we're following our main character, Caroline. She and her boyfriend, Pete, are on a luxury liner headed from the UK to New York. And then one day, Caroline wakes up, and she is completely alone. Almost everybody else on the ship has disappeared except for three other people. People. And it really becomes about their survival because they are cut off from the food stores. The water has been shut off, so they have no water. And it's really about them trying to survive on the ship. And I'm going to kind of slightly spoil the book, not the ending of the book, but kind of around the middle when they sort of find out what's going on. So if you don't want to risk any spoilers, I would skip ahead to when the book is not up on the screen. But basically, they find out that they are on some type of reality show that they didn't consent to. And as the book goes on, they realize that it is a reality show for like the dark web. So there really is no regulations to what's going to happen. And not only that, but they are in the middle of the ocean. So there really is no laws or regulatory bodies that are going to help them. They are completely on their own. And they are also each being forced to perform their own challenges. And basically, if they get to the very end, each one of them is going to win a sum of money. And I just don't feel like this was well executed at all. First of all, this was entirely too long. This was a 13 hour audiobook, and it could have easily been cut by two or three hours. And I feel like if it had been cut by two or three hours, it would have been much better paced. It would have been much more engaging and it would have held my attention a lot more. Also, I just really didn't care for any of the characters. There were four main characters, but there was only one perspective. You're in Caroline's head the entirety of the time for the story because it is her first person perspective. And I really feel like this book would have been served by having those additional perspectives. It would have added another layer, I feel like, to the story. This was certainly plot driven. You are not meant to care about the characters, and I didn't. It wasn't that they were inherently unlikable because I didn't think that at all. It was just more that I didn't care because I didn't get to emotionally connect to them because there was no way to do that. And on top of that, I'm not really sure why Will Dean did this. Caroline would frequently talk about the problems her father had when she was younger. I guess he was an excessive gambler. He had a gambling problem and he lost a lot of their family money as well as the money of other people. And so there's a lot of shame on their family. And she kept hearkening back to this. Like it was influencing literally everything in her life. And she would randomly relate things that were going on on the ship to her past with her father and her family life or something her siblings would do or something. And I was like, this makes absolutely no sense. This doesn't fit in with the story and it doesn't help me connect to this main character anymore. So that felt very out of place. It felt very jarring and I didn't appreciate that portion of the story and it actually kind of took me out. It didn't feel like it flowed well with the narrative. There were just these things thrown into the story that I didn't feel needed to be there. It didn't serve the story. It didn't flow well and it was just clunky overall and like I said it was poorly paced. I haven't officially decided what I'm going to rate it. I just have so many negative feelings about it and I think that's just because I went in with such high expectations. I think if I gave it a three star that would be very very generous. I think I'm leaning more closely to a 2.5 which I was not expecting at all. It is what it is. It ended up satisfying the prompt of reading a book related to the sea, which is good because I decided not to read the book that was originally going to satisfy that prompt. However, I will say that I did decide to DNF The Coppersmith Farmhouse by Debbie Perry, which was meant to satisfy the prompt of reading a second chance author. And I think I'm just going to have to come to terms with the fact that Debbie Perry is not for me. This is the third time that I've stopped reading one of her books. And this is actually the second time that I've stopped reading The Coppersmith Farmhouse. And at first I thought I was going to get past whatever it was that made me stop reading the first time because I did make it a little bit further into the story. I just had to stop because instantaneously when the female main character meets the male main character, there's definitely some tension between the two. Like they do not like each other, but she just cannot keep her eyes off of him. And she keeps saying things like, oh my gosh, I hope I can control myself around his hotness. Are you kidding me? There has never been once in my life when I have been in the presence of a hot guy and I have completely lost my shit. I have forgotten how to function. And I just did not like that this was happening so very early in the story. So I was like, you know what? I'm not even going to bother. I'm going to stop reading this. I'm not going to bother trying to pick something else up because I honestly don't have many, if any, second chance authors or books that I want to read. So I'm going to go ahead and just let that one go. So I did decide to go ahead and pick up Listen for the Lie by Amy Tentera. This was actually a book that I recently selected from Book of the Month. And for my gameplay, I needed to read a book that was on someone else's TBR. And this book is actually on Brittany from Be the Book Nerds TBR for the month of March. And I thought, perfect, I need to go ahead and read this. Anyway, I just started this morning while I was getting ready and I'm really enjoying it so far. It is a lot of fun. It definitely doesn't feel like it takes itself too seriously, but it's about this girl named Lucy. Everybody think she killed her best friend because one night she was found walking through town in a really nice dress with blood all over her. And so the whole town, very small town in Texas, feels like she killed her best friend. And she's escaped to LA. She's trying to move on, but she's going back to that hometown because it's her grandmother's 80th birthday. She loves her grandma. She's very close to her grandma. She wants to help her celebrate. She knows that she's not wanted in the town. She knows that she's suspected, but she's going back anyway. And things are compounded because there is now a podcast, a true crime podcast going on about Sav, Lucy's best friend's murder. So there's definitely that podcast element that we're seeing a 
lot in crime thrillers these days so it's really entertaining so far so I think that this is just going to be like a good fun time nothing super substantial or dark or anything and I'm here for it but anyway y'all another rambly clip that I'm going to absolutely hate editing so I'm gonna go ahead and head into work and I will check in with you when I have more information on listen for the lie So sorry I look like a hot mess. I just got home and I had some surprise packages waiting for me. Thank you so much Nicole from Noteworthy Fiction for sending me someone else's bucket list. I'm very excited and I also just received The Huntress by Kate Quinn but there was no gift note in there so I don't know who sent this to me. I don't know if it was also Nicole or if it was somebody else. If you sent this to me please let me know. I'm gonna post in my discord to see if anybody in there sent this to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Y'all know how much I love Kate Quinn. I actually just finished The Diamond Die a couple of weeks ago. So I'm feeling so spoiled today. So I am definitely going to be putting this on a TBR very soon. Hey y'all, so I'm actually on my way home from the gym. So that's probably why I look like a hot mess, but I just now finished Listen for the Lie by Amy Tintera. And I thought that I would come on here and update you. But y'all, I actually really, really enjoyed this story. I enjoyed this one more than I thought that I was going to. So I believe I mentioned what this is about. It follows our main character, Lucy. And five years prior to the start of the story, her best friend was brutally killed. And everybody thought that she did it because she was found walking down the street in the middle of the night, covered in her best friend's blood. And she has absolutely no memory of what happened that night and so nobody believes her nobody believes that she actually doesn't remember and people think that she did it but she legitimately has no idea what happened and now there's a podcast being made about the events of that night and she's going back to her hometown to celebrate her grandmother's 80th birthday but at the same time the podcast host is there and so they're running into each other and she actually agrees to give interviews and be involved in the podcast because she wants to find out what happened to Savvy as well and this was just a good time I would probably consider this like a popcorn read like it's just one that you get engaged with and you want to keep turning the page and you want to find Find out what happened. I really didn't mind any of the characters. I absolutely loved Lucy's grandmother in this. She was just such a character. She was one of the best parts of this book. I will say that the who done it, like the actual truth of it, was not necessarily a surprise. I predicted who did it the minute that that character came on the page. But as I said multiple times before, thrillers don't necessarily have to be super shocking or twisty. But I really need the journey to get from A to Z to be very engaging. And I found that this was. I will say that I feel like answers came out a little bit too easily in the story. Considering for the past five years, like there's been no movement on the case. And then all of a sudden this podcaster is showing up and getting all of these answers like that just didn't really feel realistic to me. I didn't really feel like anybody for the most part was against the podcast or against helping the podcaster, which I do feel is very unrealistic. But of course it helped the story move along, right? And so ultimately even the little technical things that I had an issue with did not destroy my reading experience of this at all. I am very glad that I chose this as a book of the month selection and I will definitely be looking out for more from Amy Tintera in the future. That's the reading update y'all. I'm on my way home to cook some dinner and I will give you an update once I have one. actually Sunday evening. It is about five o'clock and I've been doing a horrible job this weekend about updating the vlog because not only have I started and finished a new book, I think since my last update, but I'm actually halfway through another book already and I haven't talked about either one of these things. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is do my update about the book that I started and finished and I will save the next update probably for tomorrow because it's The Women by Kristen Hanna. Y'all, I have a lot of thoughts and feelings already about this book. It is so emotionally harrowing. It is definitely a tough, tough read.
read, but the book that I started and finished was Someone Else's Bucket List by Amy T. Matthews. This was a book that was so kindly and surprisingly gifted to me by Nicole over at Noteworthy Fiction. She sent it to me for my birthday, which I was not expecting, and so I went ahead and jumped right into it since I'm, you know, trying to read these as they come into me. This is a book that deals heavily with grief, it follows our main character, Jody, and at the start of the book, you're actually introduced to her sister, Brie, and her sister has in in the hospital with leukemia. Brie was actually a social media influencer. She had about a million followers on Instagram and she lived just like this very big life. And Jodi is very much the opposite of Brie. She's very much an introvert. She's inside of her head. She doesn't really think very highly of herself. She has very low self-esteem. She doesn't think she's worth all that much. She's afraid to take risks. She lives a very small life in comparison to her sister. And so when Brie ends up losing her fight to cancer, it just leaves such a huge hole in Jodi's life and in the lives of her family. And on Thanksgiving, they actually get a surprise message from Brie. Brie posted a video on her Instagram that was obviously pre-recorded several months in advance. She tells them of a plan because she knows that her family are in massive debt because of her hospital treatments. But Brie essentially used her connections as an influencer to kind of make a deal that will help them pay off this debt. Brie created a bucket list of 100 things that she wanted to do before she died. And this was well before she got sick. And there are currently six things left on that bucket list. And so she has made a deal with an airline company who is going to sponsor a project of having Jody do everything that was remaining on Brie's bucket list. And so Jody finds herself really caught up in this whirlwind of trying to complete things on Brie's bucket list. So it was just a really interesting concept because you're definitely following a grieving character, but you're also following this epic adventure that she is going on. So I will admit that when I first started the story, it took me a while to get into it. I felt that in some ways it was very overwritten. And y'all, this was a 13 hour long contemporary story. It definitely takes its time getting through all of the phases of the bucket list and what Jody is going through and all of the things that she's experiencing, not just in terms of grief and having to overcome a lot of fears, but having to do it in the public eye because now she's in control of this Instagram account. It has 1 million followers and she's having to do everything she's contractually obligated to this airline who is sponsoring all of this stuff that's happening. And so everybody has a camera and even the smallest things are getting recorded and posted on Instagram. And of course, there's also a romance that develops in this story as well, which was super cute and I really enjoyed it. So overall, I would say that I had a really solid reading experience with this one. Like I said, it did take me a minute to get into it, but I would say that once Jody starts to satisfy the things on the bucket list, I started to become more involved in the story. I was definitely interested in the romance that was happening in here and I gave it a four stars and I would be willing to read more from Amy T. Matthews in the future. And then like I said, I've just started The Women by Kristen Hanna that came in from my library and I wasn't expecting it. Y'all, I am busting through it. I have gotten through almost the first 50% of this book and I just started it today and it is not a short book, y'all. It is 15 hours long on audio and I might actually just be able to finish it tomorrow because I cannot put it down. This is super compelling, but it is very, very harrowing. And I really want to be able to take some time to talk more in depth about what the story is about and also kind of address some complaints that I've seen about the story. And so I think I'm going to go ahead and take the time to do that tomorrow as this clip is already getting very, very long. But that is the reading update, y'all. So I have to go clean up the after dinner mess, but I will check back in with you tomorrow when I talk about the women. Hey everybody, good morning. It is Monday and I'm about to head into work, but as promised, I wanted to come on here and do an update about The Women by Kristen Hanna, considering I will likely finish it today. Y'all know that I love Kristen Hanna so much. She is one of my favorite authors of all time and this book I feel like is probably going to be the pinnacle of her career. I am really enjoying it to the extent that you can enjoy a book that contains so much emotional suffering. So this book follows our main character Frankie McGrath and at the start of the story it is I believe 1965 and she is a privileged white woman living off of Coronado Island with her family and her brother who has just enlisted to serve in Vietnam and Frankie is currently in college to be a nurse and she decides that she wants to follow her brother. She wants to join the war effort. So she is thrust into Vietnam with practically no training, no idea what to expect, and it is almost literally a trial by fire. And you're following her over the two years that she's serving as she's becoming an incredibly capable and sought after combat nurse and all of her experiences there. And this takes up about 50% of the story. So you can imagine all of the incredibly disturbing things that she's seeing. You know, she's seeing soldiers come in there with no limbs, with their guts torn open. She's seeing them with gunshot wounds, napalm burns. She's treating soldiers and civilians alike. And so there are even kids that are not making it. So there's a lot of pain that's going on there. And she grows up very quickly, very fast. And so by the time she returns, I want to say she's like 22, 23, but she feels much older than her 22 years. You know, she's looking forward to returning home. She thinks that she's going to be able to kind of get back to life as normal. She thinks that she's going to be celebrated as a Vietnam War hero. But when she gets back to America, she finds that America is a much different place. The country is completely against the war. There are protests all over the place. Protesters are taking out their frustration and grief over the war on the soldiers who are fighting it. And so she is being spat at. She's being called names. Even her own father is not proud of her. Like they are ashamed of her service. So she's having a very hard time dealing with all of that, but also she's having PTSD.
PTSD. And this is during a time when PTSD was not known and it was not talked about. So as I mentioned, I got through about 50% of the book yesterday. So she was just leaving Vietnam and returning home to a place that was almost as devastating to her as Vietnam. She wants to go back in some ways because she misses who she was when she was there. A capable, respected combat nurse who really found out who she was. And so now we're kind of following her as she's struggling through and she's trying to find her footing and all of the things that she's experiencing during that. And y'all, I am just absolutely loving this. It is probably one of the most beautiful and harrowing books I've ever read. And there have been times when I've been reading it and I've just wanted to burst into tears because of the things that she's experiencing. And it is just such an emotional reading experience. And I do kind of want to take a minute to address some of the complaints that I've heard about this book. Like there are some people that are upset about how much trauma is in this book, like one bad thing after another. And I can't help but roll my eyes at that because this is a woman who went to Vietnam and was dealing with injuries that you couldn't even possibly imagine in a condition and environment where they were constantly being shot at and attacked. And I'm just really wondering what people were expecting when they were going into this story. So it is just emotional. It is raw. It is harrowing. I feel like Chris and Hannah does a really good job of setting the scene of what Frankie is going through in Vietnam. And then definitely what she's going through in America. And in some ways, reading what Frankie is going through in America is almost as hard for me as reading what she was going through in Vietnam. I cannot believe how American citizens were treating people who were returning from Vietnam. And not to mention the American government and how they were handling this and how they were lying to the people, how they were lying about how the war was going and the casualties that were being inflicted. And they just kept sending men to Vietnam over and over and over. And most of them were coming back in body bags. There was a lot of civil unrest, not just because of the war, but because of racial tensions and things like that. So this was a very tumultuous time in America. And so the way that Kristen Hanna is depicting it is just very rough. It is very rough to read. I'm very ashamed of the way that America acted during this time. And I really just feel for Frankie and everything that she is going through. So needless to say, Kristen Hanna is doing an amazing job of bringing this time period to life, of bringing Frankie's experiences to life. I am just so enthralled by the story. I'm so captivated and intrigued. I'm looking forward to seeing where Frankie ends up and how the story ends. Anyway, y'all, I have to head into work now, but I will check back in with you when I finished The Women by Kristen Hanna. Hi friends, it is Tuesday morning and our internet has been down at work for about an hour and a half now, so I figured it was the perfect time for me to come on here and give my final thoughts on The Women by Kristen Hanna. I have just spent the last little while picking up The Bone Season by Samantha Shannon, which is my next immersion read. It was a gift kindly sent to me by Samira. Thank you so much, Samira. I'm not very far into it at all, so I'm not really sure what it's about and all that good stuff, but I will be sure to give you an update once I know. But anyway, back to The Women by Kristen Hanna. Y'all, I don't even know if there are any words that I could use to adequately express my thoughts and feelings on this book. It is definitely one of the most beautiful and important books that I've ever read. It was absolutely stunning. I think it is now one of my favorite books of all time. You know, I always go into a Kristen Hanna with high expectations and I always think that she's going to meet them, but I never necessarily think she's going to exceed them and she definitely did with this one. Now, I believe I mentioned in my past clip that I was a little bit annoyed at people who were frustrated with this book for being one bad thing after another. I can kind of see a little bit more of what they were saying after she gets home and some of the things that she experiences because the trauma and tragedy did not end in Vietnam, that is for sure. It definitely followed her home and there were certainly a lot of other negative things that happened and she started to make really poor decisions but at the same time the underlying theme to all of the stuff that was happening was the fact she was a combat nurse in Vietnam so there's a lot of PTSD that came with her experiences. I think that Frankie's experiences are representative of a lot of people's experiences after Vietnam especially women's experiences because women were not really recognized for their service in Vietnam. A lot of people didn't even know that women were in Vietnam and so I think that her experiences were probably realistic so while I can understand the frustration over one bad thing happening after another, I do feel like it's an accurate representation, all stemming back from her time in Vietnam. Really, I think the only complaint that I had about this book was that there was one storyline that was resumed, I want to say at about the 70% mark. It had started in Vietnam and it was resumed at 70%. I didn't feel like it needed to be added. I think all it did was add extra drama to the story unnecessarily and it didn't even last very long. It became the catalyst of some important things that happened to Frankie towards the end of the story for sure, but I still feel like that could have been done in a different way. But even still, even though I do have that criticism, it wasn't enough to dampen my reading experience of this story. It was incredibly important to shine light on the story of the women who served in Vietnam because they didn't get nearly enough recognition back then. It's incredibly important for people to understand any of the experiences of any of the Vietnam veterans and what they returned to and how they were treated by their country. I was on the verge of tears multiple times while reading this story and I absolutely loved how it ended. I kind of foresaw the ending coming from very early on in the story but I wanted it to end that way and I'm absolutely 
absolutely not mad it ended that way. In fact, I kind of wish we got a little bit more exploration of the aftermath of the ending. You know what I mean? I wish that there had been an epilogue or something because I just was smiling by the ending of this story. Ultimately, this book was just as close to perfection as any book could possibly be. Kristen Hanna's writing is absolutely unparalleled. Her ability to bring characters to life and setting the scene is absolutely remarkable. She continues to astonish me with every single book that I pick up and I definitely feel like the women is the pinnacle for her. I feel like she is currently at the height of her career. This is certainly one of my favorite Kristen Hanna's. I don't know still if it surpassed The Great Alone just because of how atmospheric and intense that book was, but man, this book was just absolutely amazing. It is certainly one of my favorite books of all time. One of the most beautiful books that I ever read. I'm so, so glad that I finally read it. And then this morning, since I needed a new book, I went ahead and picked up Symphony of Secrets by Brendan Slocum. This was another birthday gift. It was so kindly sent to me by Jillian. Thank you so much to Jillian. I read The Violin Conspiracy by Brendan Slocum last year and I enjoyed it. It wasn't like anything mind-blowing for me, but I was definitely willing to read more from him, especially because I really loved the synopsis of the story. Like I said, I just started it this morning, so I'm very, very early days, but it follows our main character, Byrne, who is a professor at a college, and he's actually an expert, kind of a scholar on this composer from the 1920s named Franklin, I think, Franklin Delaney, I can't remember his first name, but basically he has been called by a distant relative of Delaney's, a woman who now runs the Delaney Foundation, and they need Byrne's help because they have recently made a very big discovery, something from the past when Delaney was still alive, and they need Byrne's expertise. He's going to basically study what it is that they found. So we're just now getting to the point where he has got the documents in hand and what this could mean for the history of the composer and music in general. And I'm enjoying it so far. I really like the mystery aspect to it. I know that there's going to be some big things uncovered and I'm here for the journey. Anyway, y'all, I would say that I need to get back to work, but since the internet is down, I literally can't. But I think I'm going to go ahead and get back to reading The Bone Season and I'll check in with you later. It is Saturday and I'm actually just about to get ready to film some videos, but I wanted to come on here and give you reading updates because I have finished Symphony of Secrets by Brendan Slocum. So I believe I gave a bit of information on what this is about, but this follows our main character, Byrne. He is a music professor, but he's actually considered like a very foremost authoritarian on a 20th century composer by the name of Frederick Delaney, who was really popular in the 1920s. And back during the 1920s, Frederick was actually undergoing a massive project of creating operas based on the five colors of the Olympic rings. And during this time, the composition for Red, Mysterious, seriously banished and so he had to create an entirely new one. And so the Delaney Foundation in the present day is calling Byrne because they think that they have found the original red composition and they want Byrne to go there to kind of decode the composition and compare the original with the one that he created to replace it. Delaney was kind of known for creating these very mysterious doodles instead of like typical musical notation marks all over the compositions and so they want Byrne to kind of go there and like I said just decode it. But throughout his investigation Byrne actually uncovers something pretty serious. Eventually his investigation leads to a woman named Josephine Reed who was a young black woman and he comes to believe that Frederick Delaney actually didn't write any of his music. It was written by Josephine Reed and that she was never given credit for it. In the present, you are following them as they are trying to uncover the mystery from the past, who Josephine was, what actually happened with Frederick Delaney, and then you're also getting the perspective of Frederick Delaney and Josephine Reed back in the 20s as they're meeting, as they're collaborating, and they're forming this partnership. And you know, of course, Frederick was a white man, Josephine was a black woman, and Frederick didn't believe that if Josephine's name was on these musical compositions that they would actually sell. So he writes the lyrics for these compositions and he sells them under his name name and then he gives Josephine her cut of the profits and how all of this ultimately escalates and what actually happens to Josephine Reed and Frederick Delaney. This gave me a lot of vibes to Big Lies in a Small Town by Diane Chamberlain. Not because like the stories are super similar but because you have a mystery from the past that is trying to be solved in the present and both of them definitely have an artistic twist and both of them definitely have themes of racism and things like that that are going on throughout them as well. So if you liked Big Lies in a Small Town you would probably like this one and vice versa. I definitely enjoyed this one more than The Violin Conspiracy. I just found 
found it a little bit more compelling and engaging and I really enjoyed watching Byrne try to solve the mystery and try to bring justice to Josephine like trying to give her credit for all of the work that she put in that she was never given. So ultimately I really enjoyed this and I gave this a solid four stars. Also I forgot to mention that Symphony of Secrets was a gift from the lovely Jillian. She completely spoiled me for my birthday and she sent me three books. The other book that she sent me and one that I immediately jumped into after Symphony of Secrets was Zero Days by Ruth Ware. Now I'm going to say that this is the book I feel like you should try if you have given Ruth Ware a chance in the past and she just hasn't worked for you. Ruth Ware typically writes very slow burn character driven mysteries and if you go into her books thinking that they are going to be high octane suspense thrillers you are going to be very very disappointed. I think a lot of people go into her books with the wrong expectations and so they are very disappointed when they are finding these very slow burn very in the minds of the characters types of stories. This is very much a departure from anything that she's written in the past. It is definitely more reminiscent of those fast paced page turning thrillers but this follows our main character Jacinta Jack Cross and she and her husband are penetration experts and basically what that means is companies hire her and her husband Gabe to essentially break in both physically and virtually to their companies to find any security flaws. And so at the very beginning of the story you're following her as she is currently breaking into a company essentially and everything seems to be going fine everything is working well but when she arrives home that night she finds her husband dead with his throat brutally slashed and she finds herself the prime suspect in his murder. Now she knows that she didn't do this to her husband but she doesn't know who did and so she actually goes on the run and so that's really what this is about. This is her trying to figure out what actually happened to her husband and so like I said this is definitely a lot more fast-paced I feel than any of her previous novels. It is definitely more on the bingeable side more of the popcorn read that you just kind of want to keep turning the pages and I'm very much looking forward to finishing this to see how I feel. So I'm currently in the middle of this. I will be finishing it soon and I will update you as soon as I've finished. currently at work but I wanted to give you an update because since my last update I have since finished Zero Days by Ruth Ware and I'm almost finished with Midnight is the Darkest Hour by Ashley Winstead. So I would say my thoughts and feelings haven't really changed much on Zero Days. I very much enjoyed my reading experience. I stand by what I said that this is probably a book to read by Ruth Ware if you've tried Ruth Ware in the past and you haven't really vibed with what she's written in the past. She typically writes very slow burn kind of character driven mysteries and I know that a lot of people don't really prefer that. They prefer the more fast paced traditional suspense thrillers and I think that Zero Days is more reminiscent of that. This is certainly a departure from anything that she's written in the past. This is definitely more fast paced. Everything keeps moving. You want to keep the pages turning. I will say that there's nothing necessarily mind blowing or unique about the story, but I did find it very compelling, very engaging. And like I said, I wanted to keep the pages turning. Very, very much enjoyed it. Thank you again so much to Jillian for sending it my way. I have now read all of Ruth Ware's published books until the newest release comes out, I think later this year. So I'm very happy about that. And then I went immediately into Midnight is the Darkest Hour by Ashley Winstead. This was a gift that was so kindly sent to me by Amanda over at On the Middle Shelf. Now I went into this one very trepidatiously because I loved In My Dreams A Hold A Knife by Ashley Winstead but I didn't really enjoy The Last Housewife. There was just something about that book that didn't work for me. I think it was because I was having a hard time suspending my disbelief. Like I didn't really believe things that were happening in the book could actually happen and so it made it so I wasn't really connecting to the plot or the character. So I went into this one very nervous but thankfully I'm really enjoying it although I will say it's a bit unusual in terms of genre blend. So this is definitely categorized as like a mystery suspense thriller but there's actually a romance at the heart of it but not a traditional romance. But it's essentially a southern gothic mystery which I love. I love southern gothic mysteries. I love the vibe. I love the atmosphere. This is set in a very small town in Louisiana and y'all know I live in Mississippi so I'm very close to Louisiana. I visit it often but this is basically set in your stereotypical small town Louisiana. You know where everybody is kind of a little bit backwards. They are very much religious extremists, religious zealots. Our main character Ruth is the daughter of the town pastor so of course she's very much been heavily scrutinized her whole life. She's afraid to take any misstep. She's a very shy person but things change for Ruth one night when she's about to go out with the boy. It's going to be her very first date. She's very excited. I will say that our main character has an unhealthy obsession with Twilight. Like Twilight of course is kind of contraband material for her family and for the town. So when she gets her hands on it, she absolutely loves it. Twilight kind of becomes her ideal romantic relationship. You know, she envisions herself in a deep love like Bella and Edward. And that's a little bit weird. That is definitely something I could not connect to in this story, but I can kind of understand seeing as how she is so sheltered and she's always told that material like this is the devil's work. So when this boy asks her out, she's all a flutter. She thinks that she's finally going to get her 
her love story. But this boy is not a nice guy and he basically attempts to rape her and suddenly Everett, a boy from school that she's grown up with, comes in and saves her and they essentially both kill this boy. Now this is not a spoiler, this is basically in the very first chapter and it kind of governs the whole rest of the book. So from there she and Everett build a very deep long-lasting friendship and you can kind of tell that they both feel something more for each other but it's never acted upon. And you're flashing back to the times when they are teenagers and they're first meeting and getting to know each other and then you're also flashing to the present which I think is only like five years in the future so it's not that too far in the present but essentially a skull has been found and Ruth is freaking out because they think that they found the boy that she and Everett killed but it actually turns out to be somebody else. Now they do eventually find the body of the boy that they killed but the fact that somebody else was killed too is really concerning to Ruth because there's somebody else in the town who is a killer and she's trying to figure out who this is and she's also trying to make it so that she and Everett are not caught for the crime that they committed and you're also following them as secrets are revealed and the relationship develops so the love story is definitely still developing in the present timeline and then again you're flashing back to the past when they're younger and some more things are going down and Everett is definitely a weird boy but the thing that draws them together are the fact that they are both outcasts you know she is the pastor's daughter so nobody really wants to get near her she's always been very shy very timid and then you have Everett who has definitely always been the outcast in the town the black sheep and so they are very much drawn together especially after the event that bonds them together and like I said I'm just really really enjoying it and I'm definitely loving the atmosphere I can absolutely feel the Louisiana swamp vibes I think that Ashley Winstead is doing it very well for the most part and that combined with the southern gothic nature of this is definitely working for me and quite honestly I'm also intrigued by the plot and I'm very intrigued by the relationship that is developing between the two I'm actually kind of rooting for them even though they are both very messed up individuals and if you read this you will know what I'm talking about so far I am vibing with the story a lot and I'm very very glad that I am I will certainly be finishing it today and then my hold for Murder Road by Simone St. James came in which I cannot believe I thought I was going to be on hold with that for several more weeks but for now I'm gonna go ahead and get back to work and I will touch base with you later I've come on here and actually done an update for reading. It is actually currently March 29th. I am at home because my university is closed in recognition of Good Friday and I'm actually about to get on and host some all-day reading sprints so I thought now would be the perfect time to actually come on here and do an update. I apologize for the loud background noise. That is actually my countertop composter that is running right now so I hope that you can still hear me. But yeah I actually have quite a few updates to give you. So I think the last update I gave I was still in the middle of Midnight is the Darkest Hour by Ashley Winstead which I have since finished and I really enjoyed it. I don't know if it worked just because it was a southern gothic nightmare or because of the atmosphere or if it was just the plot itself. I don't know but something about it worked for me. I will say that this did have an open ending. It was almost like Ashley Winstead wasn't sure how to end the story so she just basically left it very open-ended and I know that a lot of people don't like that. This personally didn't necessarily bother me but I do feel like there could have been a stronger ending. Overall still really strong reading experience and I gave it a four stars. Another book that I also gave four stars was Murder Road by Simone St. James. This is her brand new release that just came out. I had it on hold at my library and I was not expecting it to come in so soon but it came in and so of course I jumped on it. If you're not familiar Simone St. James typically writes paranormal thrillers so she writes thrillers that have ghosts in them and I think that she does ghosts so very well and this book was no exception. This follows newly married couple April and Eddie and they are actually on their honeymoon. They're heading to this hotel in Michigan. They're going to just basically stay there for five days until they have to return to their normal lives and they kind of get lost on their way to this hotel and they end up on this very isolated
populated rural road, but as they are driving down, they see somebody walking along the side of the road. It is a young girl, and they think that she might be drunk or something just because of her body language and the way that she's moving, but when they get close to her, they realize that she is covered in blood. She is injured. So they get her into the back seat of the car, they take her to the nearest hospital, and she passes away. And April and Eddie soon find themselves as the suspect, not only in this murder, but a string of murders that have happened over on Atticus Line, which is the name of the road, over the past several years. And so they're in town being investigated for the murder. Meanwhile, they're holding their own investigation because they know that they are not guilty of this. So they try to learn about the girl that was killed and they try to find some kind of lead on who might have done this. And of course, as they're investigating, they find out that it's not necessarily a human that is causing this. It is a ghost. And so now they're trying to figure out who this ghost was in life and figure out how to put her to rest, basically, to stop all of the killings that have been happening over the past, I think it was like 20 some odd years since the first one had happened. Very intriguing, very atmospheric. As per usual, I love the way that Simone St. James incorporated ghosts into this story. I feel like the ghosts that she puts into her stories have different levels of involvement in the overall stories, just kind of depending on what she needs them for. But this ghost was obviously a very important part of the story. So I very much enjoyed this. I enjoyed it definitely more than The Book of Cold Cases, which was her newest release last year. But I feel like that was a me thing, not a book thing. I feel like if I hadn't been mentally distracted when I was reading that one, I would have enjoyed it a lot more. But I definitely, definitely liked Murder Road. And then immediately after finishing Murder Road, I was still kind of in the mood for like a dark thriller ghosty type read. And luckily enough, The Haunting of Blackwood House by Darcy Coates ended up being a challenge pull for April's TBR. And since we were so close to the start of April, I went ahead and just decided to go ahead and start working on that TBR since I had already read Murder Road, right? What's the harm? Now, this is another one that I went into really cautiously because I had read The Haunting of Ashburn House and I enjoyed it for the most part. It wasn't anything like mind blowing. And then I had DNF'd another one called From Below. So I was very nervous about this one, but thankfully this one worked for me. I very much enjoyed this. This follows our main character, Mara, and she has been stuck in a crappy little apartment for a couple of years and she's really desperate to get out. She's been saving and saving and saving and so she's looking for her own place within her budget. And her realtor tells her of this house that's been vacant for a really, really long time, but it's well below her budget. And of course, Mara asks what is wrong. Well, apparently this used to be the home of a serial killer and the serial killer not only hung himself in this home, but he killed multiple people in this home as well. But Mara is not deterred. She does not believe in ghosts and she does not believe that past actions in a home detract from the house's worth. She is not afraid. And she actually grew up in a house full of spiritualists. So she's very anti-ghost, very anti-medium. She doesn't believe in any of that. She was very traumatized from her childhood. And so she is not going to let what these people are saying about this house detract her from going in there because she wants it. So she starts moving into this house and naturally she also starts experiencing some weird things. And a lot of these things are going to test what she's always thought that she's known and believed. And it's basically about her trying to figure out how to rid these ghosts from her house. I really did enjoy the haunting of Blackwood House because I felt like we got a little bit more of the characters. A lot of the story was really learning about Mara as well as her relationship with Neil. Neil is a big part of the story as well. They are together. Neil is really religious whereas Mara is absolutely not. She is anti-religion and Neil definitely feels something wrong with the house. He doesn't want Mara to stay in the house. He's trying to convince her to leave but Mara is determined to stay in the house. She loves it. She wants it and so you're getting a lot of their relationship too which I loved. I'm a character driven reader and I need to be able to have some connection in some ways to the characters. I wasn't really emotionally invested in them or anything like that but I do feel like because we got a lot more of the characters before we kind of like jumped right into the haunting of the house I feel like it worked a lot better for me than some of her past books have and my next audio is now Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan again this is another book that is on my April TBR so by the time April comes around I will actually have finished three books that were on my April TBR this is only a novella it's only an hour of listening time so I will actually finish this today this was another one of your recommendations and it's just like a slice of life in the 1980s in Ireland when the country is going through a really hard economic time. It's following one specific gentleman and so right now we're just kind of learning about him and his family and I think something is going to happen that kind of shakes up his world a little bit and that's really all I know. But yeah y'all I've been talking now for 10 minutes. Future me is going to hate editing this clip. Holy cow. But I'm gonna go ahead and get ready for sprints and I will check in with you later. <laughs> So it is currently Sunday, March 31st, and I'm here to officially round out the vlog. But honestly, y'all, I feel like I lost the plot with this vlog. I've been struggling a little bit trying to figure out when the best time to edit and upload the vlogs are because they are always secondary to my formal sit-down content, especially towards the end of the month when there are things that I definitely need to be getting out by a certain point. And so doing them bi-weekly is not really working. I'm not able to get them out on a consistent day every two weeks. I think by the time you see this vlog, it will have been almost a month since the last vlog went live. I'm also finding that doing bi-weekly 
vlogs is actually more stressful than doing weekly vlogs because there's a lot more content to worry about compiling and editing. So by the time two weeks have gone by, it's taking me an exorbitant amount of time to actually edit and upload the footage. So I think what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to do weekly vlogs. I'm going to try to fit in editing the content that I do every day on a daily basis, if that makes sense. So editing as I go. And I know that sounds like a very big duh. That's what you should be doing anyway. But it is very, very hard when you have very limited time to edit during the day. But I think in order for the vlogs to continue to work, I think I need to go back to a weekly vlog schedule. And if they come out a little bit late, if they're not like on a standard day every single week, I think that's fine. But I think that's going to allow these to be a little bit more manageable. Tomorrow is April 1st. It is the beginning of a new week. And I think that would be the perfect time to start this weekly vlogging situation. So we're going to see how it goes. I appreciate you sticking with me as I'm trying to figure out how to do vlogging on my channel. Going along with that, I actually have no idea where I last left you off in terms of updates. I think I mentioned that I had finished Haunting of Blackwood House. And then after that, I immediately jumped into Small Things Like These by Claire Keegan. This was a little novella that was on my April TBR because it was one of your recommendations. And I'm going to be honest, I'm not really going to say anything about it because it was super short. It was only an hour of time to listen to it and I didn't get much out of it. So it was truly a novella that exists and I read it and I'm going to forget literally everything about it. And I pretty much already have. I'm not going to rate it because I don't feel like it's going to be fair for me to rate this, but overall, I just really didn't find it worth it. And then immediately after finishing Small Things Like These, I picked up The Banker's Wife by Christina Alger. This is another book that was on my April TBR. I've basically gotten a big jump start on my April TBR and that's primarily because Murder Road came in so quickly from my library and I wasn't expecting it. And so after I finished that, I was like, well, I'm done with my March TBR. I might as well just continue, especially since we were so close to the beginning of April. And of course, small things like these, like I said, was just an easy novella. I was able to bust that out basically in one listen while I was getting ready. So I just decided to keep up the momentum. And I'm reading the Christina Alger to satisfy a reading challenge prompt of reading a book set in a landlocked country. And one of the perspectives in this story is set in Switzerland. And this is a thriller. It's following two main characters. We're following Marina, who is a journalist in the United States. And her boss calls her while she's on vacation saying, hey, I'm on the track of a major scoop. And so she kind of gets herself wrapped up in this very intense and dangerous story involving offshore accounts in Switzerland. And then you're following a main character who is actually in Switzerland. And she was married to a man who was a really successful banker at Swiss United, which is the international banking question in the story. And he dies in a plane crash. And this character, I think her name is Annabelle. I'm forgetting her name off the top of my head, but she doesn't believe that this plane crash was an accident. And she starts to find out some things about what Swiss United was involved in. You're following the investigation from both ladies' standpoints as they are investigating, trying to figure out what's going on. And I'm finding it incredibly compelling. I'm very interested in this story. I find it very fast paced. So I'm going to finish this one today and then we'll find out what I pick up tomorrow and you'll find out then. But anyway, y'all, thank you so much for coming along with me. I know this vlog was a little bit on the longer side because it's more than two weeks. I'm going to stop yammering. I'm going to close out this vlog and I will catch you in the next one. Thank you.